shall be heard. God bless the United States and this honorable court. Please be seated. Good morning. Uh, I'm Judge Allen. To my right is Judge Meredith. To my left is Judge Falvey. Um, before we move forward this morning, I understand that we have, uh, in addition to our normal visitors from the Department of Veterans Affairs, we have members of the uh, uh, We've got people from the Board of Veterans Appeals, and I want to welcome you on behalf of the court, and thank you for coming. Uh, we are here this morning to hear argument in docket number 17-2879, Yazubi O uh, versus the Secretary of Department of Veterans Affairs, Will, Robert Wilkie. Uh, could counsel for the parties please enter your appearance for the record? Your Honors, Rachel Donahauer from the law firm of Chisholm, Chisholm, and Kilpatrick for Mr. Eusebio. With me at counsel's table is Maura Clancy, also of the firm. Good morning, Your Honor. Lance Daly representing the Secretary, and with me this morning is Kim Walsh. Thank you. And Ms. Donahauer, you want to reserve some time for rebuttal? Yes, 10 minutes, Your Honor. All right. Uh, we'll make that happen, and feel free to begin. Judge Allen, Your Honors, and may it please the court. A medical examination was necessary to decide Mr. Eusebio's claim because the Agent Orange update suggested that his thyroid condition may be associated with his exposure to herbicides. The board was on notice of the update because it specifically referred to the updates themselves, the Agent Orange Act. Let me ask you about that. Where do they do that? On page 9 of the board's decision, it refers to the updates, Your Honor. Could you be more specific? I'm, I had trouble finding that reference. One moment, please, Your Honor. The board refers to the reports of the National Academy of Sciences um, and talks about how the Secretary's determination of presumptive conditions must be based on those reports and all other sound medical and scientific information. And then the board goes on to say that the determination regarding whether a presumption is warranted in no way affects a determination regarding direct service connection. Right, but it, it, I saw that as more of a discussion of the Agent Orange Act rather than a discussion of the uh, NAS updates or uh, more specifically, the NAS update of 2014. Um, let me, while we're on that topic, um, in your notice of intended reliance, yes, Your Honor, you um, say the same sort of thing that you argue that 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 
it was referenced, and I had trouble finding any reference to uh, the 2014 NAS report, yet that's what you say in the notice of intended reliance. You specifically say the 2014 update was discussed, and I, I, I'm, I'm just not seeing it, so. The board referred to the, the, rep the updates generally in its decision. The purple book provides evidence that the board is on notice of the 2014 update specifically. In this case, how did the purple book of September 2018 give the board notice when it made a decision in 2016? The purple book was released in 2018, Your Honor, but if you look at the, the introduction to the purple book that we submitted with our 30B notice, um, it, it talks about how it began as a project in 2013, um, expanded in 2016 to encompass all board policies and procedures. So the Purple Book is evidence of a general policy and knowledge by the board of the updates and a policy of considering the information in the updates. But what did those, what did those, with respect to this case, what did those prior documents say about this matter? About um, the thyroid condition? About, uh, uh, NAS updates, about considering them, weighing them, having notice of their contents. Well, the, to, to clarify my point, Your Honor, the, the Purple Book shows that the board had been on notice of the updates prior to the publication date of the Purple Book itself. The, the, the that's, 20 what not, that's what I'm not following. How something that was issued in 2018 and effective in 2018 gave them knowledge in 2016? Because it was a, a culmination of a, a process of putting together the board's policies and procedures. So it's, we would argue it's still evidence of the board's policy of being aware of the updates. And setting aside for a moment the Purple Book, the Agent Orange Act and 1116 also put the secretary and the board on notice of the reports. The secretary is required to obtain these reports from the academy, and it's, um, it's required to make determinations based on the findings in the reports as well. Did, did that uh, requirement, those requirements you just talked about, did those expire in September 2015? One particular requirement expired in 2015, Your Honor. The, the specific requirement in 1116 to, to make determinations about presumptive service connection sunset on September 20th, 2015. However, the Agent Orange Act and specifically its provisions about continuing to obtain reports from the NAS Congress has continued to extend that year after year, so that extended at least through the end of 2018, um, and that is why we have a 2018 update from the National Academy. The so the, but the provision uh, pertaining to the, the, the secretary is required to consider them and determine whether or not the presumption ought to change, or if not, publish a notice in the Federal Register why the presumption is not changing. That remained in effect? After September 30th, 2015? Yes, you Paragraph C. I'm, I'm speaking about the Agent Orange Act, Your Honor, which continued to remain in effect despite the sunset in 1116. So the subsections B and C in 1116 sunset in 2015. So those are the subsections about determining whether a presumption is required or should be eliminated, and also to either create that presumption or publish notice in the Federal Register to the contrary if no presumption is, is warranted. Despite that sunset, um, the Agent Orange Act provides for the agreement between the Secretary and the National Academy that, uh, I'm quoting here, shall require the Academy to, to transmit to the secretary periodic written reports regarding the academy's activities. So those reports continued to be made and the secretary continued to receive them. Okay, thank you.
As to the purple book and the other information that you point to in your brief to try to show that VA had knowledge of the NES reports, none of it's in the record of proceedings. The, the press release you mentioned, the newsletter, the purple book, to what extent are we permitted to look at extra record materials to decide what should be in the record, uh, other than the NAS report, obviously? Well, what would be the authority for us to look at that extra record material? The Purple Book, Your Honor, is is akin to the the M21 insofar as it is an, an internal policy manual that guides the board's decision. So uh, we would argue that the court is is permitted to look at that as as evidence of what the board knows in making its decision. Um, but I think, as I mentioned to Judge Favi, even setting aside the Purple Book, you still have the Agent Orange Act as, as evidence that the board was on, on notice of the contents of the updates. So the, the court, of course, can, can look to that as well. I'm not sure that answered my question. So do, do we have authority to look at any of the other extra record materials that you mentioned in your briefs? The, um, the press release you're referring to specifically, Your Honor? You mentioned a press release and an Agent Orange newsletter. To the extent we can look at them, would they need to have predated the board decision on appeal? I think yes. Um, I, I can't cite to specific authority for that. I, I think you can look at that. And, and as far as the, um, the point that those, those particular pieces postdated the board's decision, I, I still think we have evidence here that the contents of the updates were before the board. So as to that point, if, assuming the board did know about the NAS, specifically the 2014 update, is that enough? Under our case law, is knowledge that the report exists enough? I mean, specifically, our case law, Monzingo, talks about there has to be a direct relationship between the report and the particular appellant's claim. How do you meet that prong of uh, the requirement under Monzingo? Yes, I believe it is enough, and I believe that this case is distinguishable from Monzingo in, in several critical ways. The, the most primary of which is that Congress commanded VA in a climate of uncertainty about the health effects of herbicides to obtain these studies about what health effects there may be. So Man, Manzingo, as, as is distinguishable insofar as in that case, the report at issue that was trying to be brought into the record had to do with noise exposure and in-service and hearing loss. The veteran in that case was not claiming hearing loss as related to noise exposure and service. He was claiming that his hearing loss began in service. So there wasn't a factual nexus there. Here we have a veteran claiming a health effect related to herbicide exposure, and we have a report before the secretary that talks about the health effects of herbicide exposure. So the nexus that was lacking in Monzingo is present here. To what extent is it significant that the major conclusion in that report had to do with hypothyroidism, and the appellant here is seeking benefits for nodules on the thyroid? Does it matter if those are different conditions? <clears throat> it does not matter at this step in the analysis. This is a, a threshold issue of whether an examination was necessary to substantiate Mr. Uh, Mr. Eusebio's claim. So the, the, the conclusion and the findings in the report go to the nexus question on the merits of his service connection claim, but I, I think that it's enough that the, the hypothyroidism is, is mentioned as being related to herbicide exposure that shows that herbicide exposure can affect the thyroid to meet the, the, low, the low threshold at, in the McClendon analysis. You're, you're not claiming that they're the same condition, the nodules on the thyroid and hypothyroidism? No, Your Honor. We, we don't have the medical knowledge hmm. to say whether they are or are not related, and, and that, that goes to the point that a, an exam was necessary. Well, Excuse me. as to that point, 
Can we, in the first instance, say whether they're the same conditions or related conditions? Is that a medical determination? That is absolutely a medical determination, Your Honor, and, and uh, no, I don't believe this court can make that determination in the first instance, and we have a case here where the, the board failed to make that determination in the first instance, so we would ask the court to send the case back to the board for a discussion of the update and performing a new McClendon analysis here. Just to... to to emphasize the, the remaining question, whether, whether it's as likely as not that Mr. Eusebio's specific condition was related to his herbicide exposure is, is a question down the road when determining the merits of the claim, and we're not there yet. Um, and that, that is a medical determination that, that cannot be made without obtaining a medical opinion. We would, um, to, to circle back to the, the question you, you asked earlier, Your Honor, about um, discussing sort of matters um, outside the, the record, with, with respect to the Purple Book specifically, insofar as it's analogous to the M21 and it was favorable to the veteran in this case, we, we believe that the board should, should have discussed it as a even non-binding but still relevant provision. And so what precisely, what precise use are you putting to the Purple Book? The Purple Book is, is simply evidence of what the board knew. We are, not, we are not arguing that the Purple Book bound the board to do anything. We're just arguing that the, board, that the Purple Book, excuse me, showed what the board knew. And let me ask you one question on, on one other element of this. There's a, as I understand it, you, you essentially make only one argument on appeal. You make an argument that the board erred by failing to uh, obtain an exam. Uh, and you have three grounds for that. Uh, one of them is the one we've been talking about, which is the principal ground, the NAS update. Um, the second are his, uh, Mr. Zubio's lay statements. And the third is the medical record. Yes. Uh, the doctor's statement. Yes. Um, not to put too fine a point on it, um, are you really sticking with the <laughs> Uh, argument about the medical record. Um, it seems to me that, well, first of all, the board's conclusion about that seems clearly not erroneous and actually affirmatively correct. I mean, there's almost no way to read that report other than as the veteran told me this. Um, and I'm, I'm just going to, I'm sort of giving you a chance to say, yeah, we're not really riding that horse here uh, because that's a real stretch of the credibility of your of your argument. <laughs> I, I would have two, two responses to that, Judge Allen. The first is that the board didn't actually analyze that 2011 record in its McClendon analysis. It's, it's important that it analyzed it only in the merits analysis for service connection. And the secretary is, is incorrect in, in their brief as to um, as to the standard that the board applied to that 2011 record. It did not apply the McClendon standard to it. So if the board had applied the McClendon standard, which we would have to look at under prejudicial error, mm -hmm. uh, it, it, is it really your position that that record, which really basically says, the veteran told me that he thinks that this is related to Agent Orange, I mean, that's functionally what it says, you, you, you honestly are sticking with the position that that's enough to trigger an exam. No, and I don't believe, Your Honor, that that's ever been our position, that the note in isolation was enough, but, but it, it shouldn't be looked at in isolation. It should be looked at together with the, together with the update and the veteran statement. And I, I don't think we would argue that, uh, you know, the correct analysis is not to look at any one of those in isolation. The secretary has to look at all the information and evidence of record um, under 5103A when making that determination. So, um, and I, 
when looking at all of that evidence together, I think that is where Locklear is helpful here. Um, in Locklear, we had two doctors saying, I don't know what the effects of gas exposure are, and I really don't know what the cause of your condition is. And this court said that those were not enough at the merit stage or would not have been enough at the merit stage, but that was not to say at all that they would not have been enough at the McClendon step three. And in any event, as in this case, the board didn't discuss them accordingly. If there are no further questions, Your Honors. Are, are um, the three arguments that Judge Allen laid out um, pertain to Agent Orange exposure and um, the nexus between uh, his thyroid nodules and service in Vietnam. Not much discussion in your briefs or here today about Camp Lejeune. Are you conceding that the board did not err with respect to that issue? We would rest on our pleadings, Your Honor, as to the Camp Lejeune argument. I, I think, as we said in the reply brief, the veteran has exposure to, to two known toxic substances here, and the board didn't discuss those in determining whether an examination was necessary here. So, but, but for those, um, for Camp Lejeune, um, the NAS update would have no impact. I mean, it could have actually been presented to the board, right? I mean, it doesn't say anything about the chemicals he was exposed to at Camp Lejeune. That's correct. So for that, the only relevant pieces of information would be his lay statements and the medical reference. That's correct. The medical reference refer to the water at Camp Lejeune, though, or just Agent Orange? Just to the Agent Orange that exposure. Wouldn't. So okay. then it would just be his lay statements? Correct. And you, you maintain that that would have been sufficient for the board to order an exam on the Camp Lejeune point? Again, I, I don't think it can be viewed in isolation, as we argued. Well, but there's nothing else, right? Because you just answered to Judge Falvey that the medical record doesn't say anything about Camp Lejeune. And you said to me that the NAS update doesn't say anything about Camp Lejeune. That leaves only one of your arguments left, which is his lay statement. So there's nothing to read it any other way than that. There, you, it, it's a single thing. You can't isolate it any more than it is. That's correct, Your Honor. Right, okay. And, and with respect to Locklear, that, um, you brought that to our attention in a, in a, a 30 uh, uh, B notice of supplemental authority, and that's supposed to be significant um, and uh, pertinent authority that comes to your attention after the briefing. It was a 2006 decision uh, cited by the board, cited by the secretary. Um, why, why, why? I mean, wasn't that really just an argument uh, late in the game? I don't believe so, Your Honor, because in our in our pleadings, um, we we argued about how low the threshold in McClendon is, and when the the issues crystallized here as to the board's discussion of the update at the McClendon stage versus the board's analysis of the merits, Locklear came, came to our attention in preparing for today in, in providing helpful illustration of the application of the McClendon standard to similar facts. So I don't believe it's a new argument. It's further support for the argument that we made. But it didn't just come to your attention. I mean, I imagine if we looked at Chisholm briefs, Locklear is referenced often and uh, it didn't just come to the firm's attention. It's not a new authority. It's a 2006 decision. Um, I, you know, I, you know why, why shouldn't the court just strike that, uh, that pleading, that filing, and uh, say it doesn't qualify under 30B? Because it's not a new argument, Your Honor. It's simply further authority. But it's, but it's not but it doesn't meet the rules requirement that it come to the attention of the party after the party's brief has been filed. It's not, it's not a new, new, I mean, 2006, come on. 
I certainly can't argue that our firm didn't know about Locklear before. It, it simply seemed that it would aid the court in applying the McClendon analysis to the facts of this case because of its factual similarity. Thanks. Thank you. Do you have anything else? No, Your Honors. We would, um, I would simply conclude that we would ask the court to remand for the board to discuss the update and conduct a new McClendon analysis. Thank you. We'll see you on rebuttal. Um, Mr. Staley. Judge Allen, I may have pleased the court. The court should affirm the July 2017 board decision because neither the NAS update nor the Purple Book were properly before the board or the court. And without those documents, there is nothing in the record that requires VA to provide an examination. So under, the, under 7252, uh, there is an exception to that uh, where the court is prohibited from considering any material which was not contained in the record of proceedings. Uh, and that is constructive possession, and that's not applicable here. Could I just, just sort of get the elephant out here, which is, um, is there any dispute in the real world um, that the board knows that NAS updates exist? Yes, Your Honor. There's you, you, you. So you. So, so the yes is Sorry, there is a dispute. No, Your Honor, let me let me correct myself. There is no dispute that the board has actual knowledge of the NAS updates. Um, right. So, well, that's good because you know we we only see obviously a portion of the cases from the board, but um, you know a lot of them are Vietnam veterans, right? And so it seems to me that's that's got to be there. Okay. So, so, so then. Explain to me then why. So let so let's take off the table the fact that the, that this report talks about hypothyroidism and the condition is thyroid nodules. So let's just leave that aside for a second. Let's just assume that the report talked about condition X, that the National Academy of Sciences says. Absolutely, this this there, there's an association between this condition and uh, exposure to Agent Orange. It isn't yet on the presumptive list, but let's just assume that. Are you with my hypothetical so far? Yes, Your Honor. Okay. So then in my world, then there could be a veterans law judge sitting at her desk, and she could have two files, veteran A and veteran B. Veteran A has a very savvy representative who's given the copy of the relevant NAS report to the veterans law judge. Veteran B, they have exactly the same condition, this condition X that's, that's associated with Agent Orange. Um, and it would be OK, then, for the veterans law judge to ignore the NAS update with the veteran who just happened to not give it to them, but even though that it's used in the other one. Uh, so uh, the board is required under 7104, decisions of the board shall be based on the entire record of the proceedings. Could you, b before you go into the statutes, right, uh, I, I just want to, my, even if your answer is yes to the question I just asked, and I need you to answer it, it may be that that's what the law says. But I want to get out right on the table that that's the impact if we say the board actually knows these things exist, and one veteran happens to turn it in and the other veteran doesn't. Um, that's your position then, right, With that the person who doesn't turn it in, the board has to pretend like that document simply doesn't exist? Uh, Your Honor, if the veteran turns it in, the board has to consider it. If the veteran does not turn it in, the board does not have to consider it. And so so the answer to, to my question is yes, right, that, that the board simply will act as if that, that document doesn't exist. Correct, Your Honor. And so now then, 
take us through how you get there. Meaning, you started to use the statute book and explain to me why why that is. So, or to use Judge Meredith's framing of the issue, why wouldn't this be before the board constructively? So, uh, this would conflate evidence in a particular veteran's records with uh, generalized statements prepared by the National Academy of Sciences, which were used to uh, inform the secretary on whether a particular condition uh, has, uh, has uh, it's entitled to presumptive service exposure. Um, these are statu- and um, so, uh, but they would be relevant evidence, right? So, so if 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 the veteran turned in the NAS update, say say for example in this case, Mr. Azubio, assume he had given a copy of this to um, the veterans law judge who was presiding, um, the the judge would have had to would have had a statutory obligation to consider that, right? Yes, Your Honor. And they would have balanced the fact that there was a a suggestive indication between hypothyroidism and exposure to Agent Orange and would have asked the question, is that enough of some indication under McClendon to trigger an exam, right? Yes, Your Honor. So even though the report was prepared for purposes of presumptive service connection, it has relevance for direct service connection as well, right? Under those limited circumstances, because it's made part of the record. Yes, I, I understand your point being that if it's not there, even if they know it exists, then it, you know, it's like the tree falling in the middle of the woods, right? Nobody's there to hear it sort of thing. Uh, but the point is, if it's there, they would have to consider it, even though it was prepared for presumptive service connection, because it's relevant for direct as well. Correct. Yes, Your Honor. So, but if it was not under Monzingo, under, under either the specific rule outlined in Monzingo or in the broader rule, the board would not have to consider it. So uh, as setting aside the issue of whether they're the same condition or the different condition, um, the, the NAS update uh, does not have a, have a direct relationship to the appeal, and the connection cannot be tenuous. So it's not a direct relationship because these are, are um, simply uh, generalized medical and scientific principles. Yeah, but aren't these, I mean, you know, it, it, I'm reminded of uh, uh, a book by George Orwell, um, Animal Farm, and he's got, a, he's got a line in the book that I've, I've always liked, which is that all animals are equal, but some are more equal than others. <laughs> and it, it strikes me that the NAS updates I sort of fall into that category. I mean, they're not just a, a normal government report that's sort of a one-off sort of thing. Um, Congress seems very concerned with Vietnam-era veterans. Uh, and in the Agent Orange Act of 1991, I mean, specifically said, every two years you're going to produce this report and you're going to give it to the secretary. Um, it, it, it just seems that like that is a very different type of, of document. It's not asking the VA or the board rather to scour the 400,000 people uh, at the agency to figure out what's in their desk drawers or something. Oh, yes, Your Honor, but I don't think the Agent Orange Act intended the, um, uh, this to constitute evidence when making individualized adjudications. And this was, there was a similar situation uh, in Monzingo, where the the um, noise and military service, which was supported by a contract between the National Academy of Sciences and VA, and was submitted to VA uh, pursuant to a public law, there the court found that uh, it was not specific to Mr. Monzingo, and the only connection between the report and Mr. Monzingo's claim is that the report generally discusses hearing loss as it relates to military service. So here the situation would be similar, um, assuming that we were talking about hypothyroidism or any other condition. Uh, there was, it, would, uh, it would be a very limited connection or a tenuous connection that would uh, reasonably support any expectation that the NAS 
But, but, but that argument, though, you're making now doesn't require any consideration of what is in the document, right? In other words, um, it's not that the connection between the report and the veteran is too attenuated because this is talks about hypothyroidism and not nodules. That's a separate argument, right? Right, sure. Because even if it said thyroid nodules are caused by Agent Orange, the Secretary's position would be exactly the same, that if the veteran doesn't actually give the report to, to the veteran's law judge, not considered, even though the board might have actual knowledge of the report itself. I'm sorry, Your Honor, uh, would you please repeat? Right, I, I, I just want to make sure that, that I'm understanding that the secretary understands that the two arguments you've advanced in the brief are, are analytically distinct, right? The argument that, hey, the report talks about hypothyroidism and that isn't the condition he has, so no harm, no foul, okay? That is one type of argument, right? But your argument about why the board doesn't have to consider NAS reports at all if they're not actually in the record cannot depend on what's actually in the reports, right? It doesn't matter how relevant information is in the report. Your argument is if it's not before the, the actual VLJ, Veterans Law Judge, in a case, they do not have to consider it. That is correct, Your Honor. So um, if your honors have no more questions, uh, in the end, the law did not require VA to provide the veteran the medical examination he seeks, and the board therefore did not err in this regard. The secretary respectfully submits that the court should affirm the board's July 2017 decision denying service connection for a benign thyroid nodule. Thank you, Thank you, Mr. Steele. Donna Howard. Thank you, Your Honors. Just wanted to address the Secretary's point about Congress not intending for this information to be used in individual ad adjudications, providing evidence as to why the updates were not before the secretary and the board here. Um, to, to go back to Judge Falvey's earlier question about the sunset provision, um, it, I would just point out that under, that under that sunset provision, the secretary may or may not currently be obligated to make determinations about presumptive conditions, but Congress has nevertheless seen fit to continue to extend the obligation to have a contract with the NAS to get information about the health effects of herbicides. So those reports cannot be meaningless in individual adjudications of veterans' claims. And given the the significant evidence of Congress's concern that VA should be keeping on top of the knowledge of what the health effects of herbicides are, it cannot place the burden on an individual veteran and come down to whether a veteran does or does not submit these findings that are within the Secretary's possession and control. The, the Secretary tries to strengthened the analogy to Manzingo um, and, and talked about the test set forth in, in Bell and um, developed after that. And, and one of the things that Bell said is that the secretary cannot turn a blind eye to information that's within its control. And, and that is the case here. Furthermore, the, the fact that it contains 
generalized medical and scientific principles does not mean that there's not a nexus to the case here that that seems to speak more to the nexus question than the constructive possession question and and even if it does that is enough at McClendon step three um, the the fact is that those generalized medical and scientific principles pertain to the very question that's at issue here is whether the condition is related to herbicide exposure. If there are no further questions. Um, we would ask for a remand for the board to discuss the update. Excuse me. Thank you. Thank you to all counsel. Uh, the matter is submitted for decision, and the court will come down and greet counsel.